Hello everyone, my name is Snil Sharma and uh, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar with Robert Zurich and George Osborne. This is part of a series of webinars hosted by the Conservative Friends of Commonwealth uh, with influential conservative thinkers across the world. I want to point out that a recorded version of this webinar will be available shortly uh, after the end of this broadcast. We have with us George Osborne, um, who will be conducting the majority of this webinar. As most of you will already know, George Osborne was the Chancellor of Exchequer from 2010 to 2016. Uh, he was a Member of Parliament for Tantum from 2001 to 2017, and is currently the Evening Standard Editor-in-Chief. George, we are grateful for your participation today. Welcome. Thank you very much. Also here with us today, uh, Robert Zulik, who was the president of the World Bank from 2007 to 2012, uh, US Trade Representative from 2001 to 2005, Deputy uh, Secretary of State from 2005 to 2016. Um, his experience spans six US presidents, uh, presidencies, and today we are here discussing his new book, um, America and the World, a history of the US diplomacy and foreign policy. In this, um, Robert Zurich tells the story of American diplomacies and the traditions that shaped it. Um, Robert, we're delighted to have you with us today. Pleased to be with you. Uh, um, so we'll, towards the end of this, we'll get a couple of questions in from our audience. Uh, but for now, I'll let you both begin the webinar. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sunil, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with the Conservative Friends of the Commonwealth and a particular pleasure uh, to be um, uh, helping uh, Bob Zellick, my good friend, uh, explain his, his wonderful new book to all of you, uh, which I have read and I, uh, and I thoroughly recommend, which is the first thing I thought I should say. Um, and, and Bob and I have known each other over the years. I first met him when I was the shadow chancellor, uh, when I made a trip to Washington, uh, and he was the uh, deputy secretary of state in the George W. Bush administration. Uh, and then as chancellor, I worked uh, with him uh, when he was president of the World Bank. And we also uh, toured various uh, US Civil War battlefields together, uh, and he is basically the best guide you can have if you want to do that. So I was very fortunate. Uh, Bob. I'm going to start with the most uh, sort of basic of questions, which is, you've written this book, it's a history of diplomacy. It's, n it's not a memoir, even though you've had a life that you could write a memoir about. Um, so why did you choose to write this book? Well, George, let, let me start by, by uh, thanking you and Sunil and Paul for, for uh, organizing this. Uh, for the audience, I have to explain that George and I first met over history. So he came over with William Hague, and I had read uh, Hague's uh, biography of Pitt, uh, and uh, later his, his book on Wilberforce. So we bonded over history when, when George wasn't doing all that account work at the uh, Stecker, trying to make the numbers add up. Um, so uh, I've always enjoyed history and always thought about it when I was actually trying to think about the policy issues we worked on. But I had read, uh, Henry Kissinger's book, Diplomacy, uh, over 20 years ago. And for people that recall, that's a book where Kissinger uses history to talk about foreign policy. Um, <clears throat> and I very much uh, enjoyed the approach, but I always thought he reflected more of a European experience. And so I've been trying to play with the idea about how to do something that offered more about the American ideas and experience. So the approach I took in this book is to focus on people, for people, readers that are interested in biography, stories about particular episodes. And so it really emphasizes the practical work of diplomacy in contrast with a lot of the writing these days, which is international relations theory or different sort of frameworks. And I don't know about your own sense of this, George, but my experience was that some of the theoretical work didn't seem to apply too much when you're dealing with the real problems of the day. And so I wanted to try to explain that to people. Um, I also enjoyed the field of diplomatic history since I was in, in university. And that's a field that has somewhat faded over the years, in part because for understandable reasons, uh, unappreciated actors and themes have been brought in. But at least in the United States, 
it's led to a phenomenon that uh, a historian at, at Harvard, Fred Logoval, noted. He said, why do we stop writing political history? Um, so I wanted to try to nudge back into that field. And uh, George, perhaps like you, when I was working with some of my younger colleagues uh, and I would discuss history with them, I realized that insofar as they knew about diplomatic history, it really had started in World War II. And they're, the first 150 years of the United States actually have lots of interesting characters and experience that I wanted to draw on. And the, the larger exercise here, which might be of interest to this group more broadly, is how do we try to apply history to think about problem solving? Um, you know, consider how people in their era and day try to, uh, in a sense, dealt with the case studies. So what would you do in those circumstances? So that's what, what led me to write the book. And it, it, you, you do, as you, as you sort of allude to there, Bob, I think it's very interesting in that you base it around, for those who haven't yet read the book, most of the chapters, not all of them towards the end, but most of the chapters are based around individuals. And that's, uh, we're going to go through some of those inter individuals. And I've picked some people who, you know, not are not as familiar perhaps to certainly a British audience than um, people like John F. Kennedy, who you also talk about. But um, before we get to that, you know, it's quite, a, it's, it's kind of kind of classic his question that is always posed in a history class. And I guess if you're a practicing uh, policymaker, you also in your darker moments ask, which is what difference does the individual make? I mean, by choosing these individuals as the, as the headings of each of your chapters, you're implying that individual people, largely men, uh, because of the time we're talking about, but of course, uh, these days women as well, you know, do have a massive impact on decisions of war and peace that then go on and affect millions of other people. Um, it's very much rooted in people, individuals. And that, as you were alluding to, is not really where the academic work is at the moment. Just to elaborate on your experience, because you've worked alongside so many famous American presidents, and the role of the individual before we get on to some specific individuals. Well, the best way I could answer that is when people read the book, they can look at the stories and see whether the decisions that people made seem to be of significance to them. Um, I think in academic parlance today, it's now referred to as agency. Uh, the, the actions of people matter. Um, and <clears throat> you're exactly right, George. There's a, there's a school of thought that suggests that all, all events are, are dictated by structural phenomenon or various themes. And that's a lot how history is taught. And uh, I guess I go back to the Carlisle, who that, that in a sense, all history is based on biography, is, is that, uh, of course, people have to deal with the reality of their circumstances. And that's part of what the book is about, is how people make practical decisions. Um, but it's also a perspective on history where perhaps it's a useful optimism these days, is the idea that history can give us some guide about how to do better. Um, with perhaps uh, you know, imperfect results in a far from perfect world, as opposed to the notion that history has timeless obstacles that you can never overcome. Um, and so we can think about many experiences, but you know, if I think about you know, in World War II, did Churchill make a difference um, in terms of, uh, uh, as opposed to Chamberlain or um, the alternative for Chamberlain was uh, um, Halifax. So at least the history suggests those two people would have made quite a difference. Um, and if you think about various people uh, today in the United States, would it have mattered if Donald Trump was elected versus Hillary Clinton? Well, I suspect so. So uh, the, the devil will be in the details of the stories. Right, well, let, okay, so we're gonna get going with some individuals, then we're gonna draw some themes and then talk a bit about some future individuals. Um, let's let's start with the very first person. Well, the very first person you introduce us to is actually Benjamin Franklin, um, who has been insulted by the British um, and given a, literally a sort of dressing down. And then uh, years later, concludes this uh, crucial treaty with France, which enables the Revolutionary War to be won, uh, wearing the same coat that the Brits had. Um, had uh, had um, humiliated him in, but but we'll, but I'm going to start with the first sort of person you really introduce us to, um, and the first chapter of the book, first proper chapter, that is Alexander Hamilton. Now, uh, I think if we'd been doing this ten years ago, 
uh, most of the people listening would have gone, well, who's Alexander Hamilton? Or they might have recognized the name from the banknote. But, you know, uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda has, 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 you know, laid the groundwork for your book with his, uh, his musical. So I think people are much more familiar now with who Hamilton is. I thought the interesting thing is you, you this is a book about American diplomacy and American diplomats. And you start with the U.S. Treasury Secretary, not the U.S. Secretary of State at the time, who's quite well known as well, Thomas Jefferson. So tell us, you know, and, and of course infused through this book, and I would suggest knowing you pretty well through your own career, has been that where kind of economics and diplomacy come together. Uh, so tell us a little bit about Hamilton. Uh, we'll maybe come on to the British angle on this, but just start by why did you start with the Treasury Secretary and, and what's, where does economics feature in diplomacy then and now? Well, I thought that would appeal to a former Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, <laughs> but just a, a, a word to finish on Franklin. You, you left out the amusing part. It turns out that Franklin's secretary was a British spy. So he sends the two treaties uh, to Britain, allegedly within 42 hours. And in the spirit of modern times, he shorts the market before <laughs> he sends the treaties. So part of my message, of course, is diplomacy is not only settling scores as Franklin did after the humiliation in London, but uh, it, it also includes um, sort of uh, espionage and, uh, uh, and scoundrels. Yeah, I'm so Hamilton was, <laughs> Hamilton was not a scoundrel. Uh, so uh, in the American experience, Hamilton is the father of economic statecraft. And what I wanted to do in this chapter is many people are now familiar with the role he played in US economic policy, but there was an important diplomatic component to that. And he was trying to develop a system of financial and economic power. And in fact, he looked closely to the Bank of England experience. And one of the observations he had though, however, was that he, he wanted to raise money and pay the U.S. debts to attain political, economic, and social ends, uh, not just have them incidental, as in a sense came out of the Bank of England experience. Um, he also had a, uh, came to a concept about financial credit and war. So there's this amazing account where in 1781, so our Revolutionary War has been going on for about six years, um, he retreats to the library of his father-in-law and he, and he tries to contemplate the nature of the ongoing war with Britain. And he basically recognizes this is a war of attrition. And the wars of attrition in part depend on credit and, and staying power. And uh, his promotion of that system actually creates an irony with Jefferson because as I mentioned in the next chapter, Jefferson is the purchaser of Louisiana, which he would never have been able to do if he didn't have the quality bonds that Hamilton had been able to produce. And indeed, he comes to, Jefferson comes to an interpretation of the Constitution, which is much broader than Jefferson had when he was fighting with Hamilton. The other little British angle of that, of course, is this is an era where bonds had to be translated into specie. So Barings was one of the two banks that the United States used to actually change the bonds into coins. And, uh, and yet, it's quite intriguing. This is at a moment where Britain is returning to conflict with Napoleonic France. Um, but it gets a special dispensation from one of your predecessors at, at the Treasury. Um, but Hamilton also has a strategic outlook. Uh, he, he, he views the young United States within a wider Atlantic outlook. He, he does not, he's not an isolationist by any means. Um, he has a sense also of the importance of the Mississippi River Valley, which people would assume now, but at the time was the United States' other oceanic or, or, uh, or water border. And so he has a concept of making the United States both a land and a maritime power. He has a strong sense of the balance of power. So Talleyrand, who amazingly is in the United States at this time, mentions that Hamilton divines Europe. And what he's saying by that is he understands the, the forces and the balance of power. Um, intriguingly, um, he starts a dialogue with an emissary of the, the governor general in Canada that today we would probably call a strategic dialogue. And he's basically suggesting to the British, look, you're the superior power, uh, but we have something to offer and we can develop a system within your maritime framework. And over time, we'll grow and become more important. And he, he swats away the, what he considers to be the less important issues. He 
deals with the ones like British troops still left in the forts. And it's intriguing that this is probably a footnote in British history, but Lord Shelburne, who's the first minister at this time, has a similar idea, but neither Shelburne nor Hamilton have the political weight to carry it. Uh, so it takes us another 100 years to develop that degree of, of partnership. So Hamilton moves to a strategy of neutrality, which governs American policy for over a century. But it has a very important tilt towards Great Britain. And as I've discussed the book with some other American historians and policymakers, very few people recognize over 90% of America's revenues came from customs until really our civil war. So if you disrupted trade, <laughs> you're going to kill the revenue uh, for paying bonds and the administration. So this was a very practical judgment uh, that Hamilton made about trying to avoid conflict with Britain. The, the, uh, the last thing I'll say about Hamilton that I think makes him particularly intriguing is, and he, he writes this, he, he studied people like Colbert and others, and he comes to the conclusion that states people shape events, not just wait for them. And George, I'll give you credit on this. This is an area where I think you also uh, saw your policy role. Um, and he perceived the whole as well as the system of the parts. And that's another challenge. And I think when you were at the Chancellor or Checker, you tried to see the connection of those issues. As you know, <laughs> that's actually not so common in policy. People tend to kind of wait for their inbox or see with the problem of the day. But so while I'm writing about problem solving, I'm also trying to say the importance of connecting it to a design. And the last thought about Hamilton as a, as a diplomat, it's something that Franklin emphasizes too. Uh, people underestimate the importance of, of treating individuals with a certain respect and dignity. Hamilton, while very rational, understands the role of emotions. And he, he makes a point, as Franklin does, that you know, even small gestures can make significant uh, effects on, on important people and, and great events. Um, if, if you'd read John Bolton's book these days, I suppose you'd have a slightly different approach to diplomacy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I could directly compare the two of them. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I take from it Alexander Hamilton, you know, first of all, credit worthiness uh, and your ability to raise money to fund your foreign policy is absolutely central. And, uh, you know, I think is a much sort of underappreciated feature generally of foreign policy. Also, the Hamilton- confidence, The one thing about that, I hadn't really focused on this until I did deeper research. One reason that Hamilton was so eager to get the funding system in place was he recognized that this confidence in credit was not only a matter of the formalities, it was important with the psychology about the United States being willing to act promptly to take care of the debts after we'd made a mess of it. That's a very interesting insight for people dealing with financial markets. Yeah, and it's also, I would say, you know, people maybe outside of the foreign policy sphere wouldn't think of it, but you know, the US's dollar is as important as its nuclear arsenal uh, in, in the way it is seen and respected in the world, and it's a very important instrument of policy. Let me jump forward. I'm gonna jump forward to another incident involving Britain. And that is the American Civil War. I, I suspect not, I mean, the American Civil War is quite well understood in Britain um, and seen in, I guess, rather sort of classic uh, good and evil terms uh, around the battle over slavery. But what about, um, uh, what I found, this, here's something I didn't know until I read your book, that Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, uh, just before he dies, literally in the last couple of weeks before he dies, very sadly, Typhoid, I think it is. Uh, basically, you, you, you imply anyway, it stops Britain going to war with the North in the Civil War. Uh, and there's been an, you know, we don't have time to go through it all, but there's been a kind of incident in the sea and an American ship has been, North American ship has been seized and Confederate emissaries have been taken off the British ship. And anyway, so there's basically a big standoff there's Abraham Lincoln in the White House. There's a man called William Seward, who's the Secretary Seward, of State. Yeah. Seward. Uh, but how does Prince Albert stop Britain going to war with uh, the United States? Um, and, and what are the lessons? Because I think you also draw a lesson there in how Kennedy handled the Cuban Missile Crisis, which, by the way, also involves ships and blockades uh, a century later. But uh, let's start with um, the Prince Consort. So for, for the listeners, the U.S. Civil War is 1861 to 1865. And as you mentioned, uh, the, the bookshelves sort of collapse under the weight of books on battles and generals and now social effects in slavery. 
but very few in the United States as well look at the foreign policy issue. Um, and the, the fundamental foreign policy question was how to avoid foreign intervention. And one has to start in realizing in 1861, Britain and others in Europe really expected the South's secession to secede. Recall, you know, Britain had tried to, to subjugate the Southern states of the United States in a revolutionary war, realized they could win battles, but couldn't uh, control those states. And they didn't expect that 60 or 70 years later that the North would be able to do so. So the diplomatic challenge for Lincoln and Seward is to change the attitude, which means some sense of threat, but also restraint. It's a classic brinksmanship. We don't really want to create a second war. And as you mentioned, this incident was with the HMS Trent where these Confederate commissioners were, were taken off. Palmerston demands the release. Palmerston was quite negative towards the Union, which he thought was frankly uppity and, and uh, too democratic. Um, and war looks quite likely in, uh, in December of, of 1861. And the role that Prince Albert plays is a quite fascinating one. He doesn't change the substance of the note. He changes the tone. He, he, he emphasizes that, well, of course, the United States didn't mean to sort of create this crisis. And of course, you wouldn't want to add to your burdens. And so it's basically, he allows uh, Lincoln and Seward to give up the Confederate commissioners, but to save face in doing so. And there's a, uh, speaking, since we're joking about rule of law today, there's a wonderful legal interpretation, which is that Seward, of course, who has to do I, I'm with not it. sure everyone is regarding it as a joke about the rule of law, Bob, but it's, well, a, certainly a, heat, it's certainly a heated argument about uh, yeah, um, but this, we this should abide by what, international treaties or not. Well, this, this will give an analogy, I guess. So, so, so Seward, of course, has to explain all this to the American people who were overjoyed about taking the Confederate commissioners, the Union is doing bleak on the battlefield. So he, he finds this a memorandum from an earlier period in US history where of course, Americans had objected to British uh, ships taking uh, people off American, or taking American sailors off ships. Um, and so he says, ah, oh, Britain has just accepted our position that you can't take people off ships unless you go to a prize court. So it's part, he has to sort of explain this at home. It's a case of creative lawyering, but for Lincoln, it's, it's one war at a time. But the, the story continues. So um, in 1862, given Britain's textile industry, the cotton export trade was critically important, a very large scale unemployment. And you start to have a debate, uh, including with Gladstone and others that are basically saying, look, should we try to mediate this? Should we seek a ceasefire? And the wonderful comparison of this was I, I organized a seminar at Aspen in the 90s and invited Sir Michael Howard a great military historian. And, and he used this incident as an example of the, the challenges of what we called then humanitarian intervention. So if you'd had a United Nations in 1861, it probably would have said, oh, we have to create a ceasefire between the North and the South to stop this terrible bloodletting. And, and uh, Sir Michael's point was partly sometimes you have to let the parties fight until one wins, or at least they decide among themselves uh, to give it up. Um, but the decision in Britain was basically, the Tory party actually weighed in on this with the governing, uh, uh, with Palmerston's government, where they recognized, look, if we try to intervene, we're just going to get caught in the war. The, the North is not going to give up. And frankly, they may decide to take Canada. Um, so it was quite, it's interesting when I discovered that Palmerston sort of reached out to the, the Tory leaders. And, and uh, of course, they're starting to also reflect the attitude towards Tory democracy. So if they're looking towards the broader electorate and attitudes towards the civil war. And that was the third interesting dimension of this, which is that people may recall in September of 1862, Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, which frees all the slaves in the Confederate areas where the Union doesn't have troops. So it doesn't free all the slaves. That happens in, until 1865. And I think that Lincoln and Seward thought that this would appeal to British public opinion because it finally aligned the United States against slavery. But the first reaction is quite interesting. Palmerston is horrified. They call it, you know, servile insurrection. And this again shows the importance of understanding context because for them, we would, might use a different term today, but they're looking at the Indian mutiny of 1857. And the idea of having people rise up in revolution doesn't sound like such a good idea. But then something quite interesting happens. 
the United States intervenes in British politics. Oh. <laughs> we, they actually fund uh, groups and newspapers and, and, uh, and working men's associations. And there's a rather famous letter that Lincoln sends to the working uh, men of Manchester saying, look, this is our war, but this is a humanitarian cause. And, and you know, we really appreciate you standing with us. And so you start to get this notion of an Anglo-American public opinion, which actually creates a little earlier, but it's quite significant over time. And then the last connection of this is uh, during the Civil War, Britain um, allows the Confederates to create what are known as Confederate Raiders. So the Alabama was the most famous and they decimate U.S. <laughs> merchant marine. It's quite a point of frustration. And so this leads to long-term unhappiness between the United States and Britain, which eventually was resolved in an arbitration in 1871. And this was quite novel because it even involved sort of foreign arbitrators in the panel. And by this point, Britain is looking at Europe and saying, well, maybe it's not such a good idea to support countries that will uh, allow raiders to be uh, built to go after merchant fleets, because that wouldn't be so good for the British position. And uh, I think their award is almost like $15 million. Uh, and, uh, but it also is a way of kind of settling some of the dispute. And the last little footnote is um, Seward actually was proposing that rather than take the money, the United States take British Columbia, because there was a movement in British Columbia to join the United States. Uh, and again, this is something that probably very few people in Britain would be well aware of. But if you look at the creation of modern Canada, it happens in 1867 with the North American Act. And that wasn't accidental because basically uh, London was concerned that this successful and belligerent American country might decide to take the northern provinces. And so modern Canada is created with the four eastern provinces they reach out to British Columbia, and there's a long distance between, and they say to the British Columbians, what do you need to join? They say, we want a transcontinental railway, and you want us to help deal with our debts. So back to the Chancellor of the Exchequer role. And so that's <laughs> why modern Canada was created. That's why Vancouver is Canadian. <laughs> the, um, the, um, maybe this is the moment just to touch on the British relationship. I'm going to touch on some other relationships that America has in the world, uh, and, and, we've been, and then we're going to take questions. But um, you know, obviously we describe it uh, as the special relationship. Sometimes that's mocked even in British circles. Um, and we have um, all sorts, you know, all sorts of examples of whether uh, British prime ministers are too slavish to American presidents. Uh, you know, one of our favorite movies, um, Love Actually has a British prime minister standing up to an American president. Um, and you, you worked uh, as the Deputy Secretary and also the Trade Representative for George W. Bush and Tony Blair was accused of being too close. Donald Trump has made you know, life interesting for British Prime Ministers. What, just tell us about the British-American relationship, not the, the sort of saccharin stuff. We know about the, you know, the, the joint sacrifices and the, and, and, and the shared values, but what is it? If you're sitting in the State Department or the White House as you have in your career, what is, where does Britain feature on the map? Well, the starting point, and this may come as a surprise to some people in Britain, but I, I think the special relationship in general in the United States is treated with more respect than it's treated in Britain. <laughs> people are, are actually proud of the association. Um, but of course, it's an evolving one. So we, we, we started with you know, Hamilton and, and Shelburne kind of being ahead of their time. There's an interesting comment that Hamilton makes as he's reaching out uh, to, to London. He says, you know, we think in English. And it's an interesting comment, and I've often reflected on it, reflecting kind of shared attitudes, approach, values, problem solving. I've certainly seen it in my career. You know, even when there were differences, um, in a sense, the intellectual framework that people bring is more common, uh, partly because of democracies, but also legal systems and others. Um, I have a chapter on something called the Monroe Doctrine. So this is in the 1820s. And this is an interesting period because Canning is starting to move away from Castlereagh's sort of uh, concert of Europe uh, arrangement. And he actually proposes to the United States, look, why don't we form some common agreement to thwart the idea that uh, the empires of, of Europe, the, the, uh, the Holy Alliance could reconquer the Latin American republics. And John Quincy Adams, by the way, with an eye on American politics, because he's seen as being friends with Britain, even though he probably uh, saw some of the tensions. 
uh, creates a, uh, an announcement by the United States without Britain. And it's interesting, the British press respond to it and say, well, this is so amazing, it almost sounds British. <laughs> and so you start to get this notion of the, the, uh, the public opinion. Um, an interesting, another interesting one is John Hay, who's known in the United States for the Open Door Doctrine in 1900 with Britain. And very few people know the idea actually comes from what I call idea merchants from Britain. So Britain and other European countries are carving up China. China could have gone the way of Africa. That was not the US view. And frankly, there was a school within Britain that said, look, our long-term commercial interests are to try to keep it uh, an open door relationship. Um, World War I is an interesting piece because uh, as, as some people may know, the United States sort of not only holds off for three years, but we never join as an ally. We join as an associated power. And at one point, King George V says, he says, do we have a belligerent here or an umpire? Because Woodrow Wilson is trying to sort of uh, play both sides of it. And again, from the American point of view, remember this is the era where you have the Dublin uprising and you have a strong Irish American uh, uh, population on this. Um, and there's a wonderful example during this period, Britain is still spying on the United States and Britain discovers what is infamously known as, in the United States as the Zimmerman telegram which was an effort by Germany to reach out to the Mexicans to tell the Mexicans, if you join us fighting Americans, you can recover Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. For some reason, they leave out Arizona. And this is a wonderful example of British skycraft because you, you can't make this up. The Germans send the message over an American cable. So they're abusing the American cable traffic. Britain intercepts the American cable but it doesn't want to let the United States know that it's spying on the United States. So it arranges uh, a special uh, espionage in the embassy in Mexico City to get the cable and give it to the United States. It's quite wonderful spycraft. Um, in the, I think the period really starts to build in the 1920s. And I have an interesting chapter on Charles Evans Hughes and the Washington Naval Conference in Belfort. And you can see how these two leaders really start to come together but it's also, this is an era where um, both Britain and the United States after World War I no longer have to worry about Atlantic security until the German submarines come back. So it's really a question of Asia Pacific security. And while Britain had taken a balancing approach in Europe, in other regions of the world, it tended to find a local power it would work with. And Japan was the local power for, for Britain in the Pacific. So, this is unsettling to the United States and basically the US presses Britain to give up the Japanese treaty. And in a sense, Britain starts to buy an insurance policy in terms of, of American uh, security. Um, and then, of course, in the Great Depression, uh, the United States trying to rebuild the trading system by now, in part because of our protectionism, Britain has created the imperial preference system. The United States finds a lot of frustration with the imperial preference system. But it's somewhat unfairly because we have these neutrality laws that wouldn't, would perhaps limit what we would sell to Britain in the event of war. And Britain has to make sure as it's facing conflict in Europe in the late 1930s that it's got supply systems. And then I think the key switch, and, and you had a little aspect of this too, was the post-World War II expectations. What you could see after World War II is the people who start to design the post-war system expect that Britain will be able to play a more powerful role. They don't really have a sense of the full economic set of devastation. And I think what we were called discussing, there was a loan gave to Britain for about 50 years. And I think you paid off the last piece of it. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, but That's so there's frustration. There's gratitude for you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's frustrations with the creation of the GAD and the trading system. But uh, when the United States opts for the new alliance system, and the creation of NATO. Britain plays a critical role in this, including uh, with the British Army of the Rhine and the Federal Republic of Germany. And this continues with Macmillan and JFK and Reagan and, and, and Thatcher. And I guess the, the way I would wrap it up is that over these 200 years, what you do see is some sense of shared principles, uh, an outlook that changes as the countries change. Um, and in the case of Britain, it's not only uh, the traditional alliance, it's the, the role of 
uh, frankly, the Treasury, the Bank of England, the legal system, these all are natural fits with kind of the United States view of an international order. And I guess I would just close as Britain sort of thinks about its future uh, and it thinks about how it's going to play on the international stage. One should not undervalue those institutions. Those institutions allow Britain, in a sense, to punch above its weight. Um, but also, you want to have a country that has the elasticity to adjust to things. And my last point, however, which you know of because you helped create this National Security Council, full service powers uh, get extra points. So I, when I watch the discussion of British defense, I'm always a little anxious because I, I don't, I, I hope Britain doesn't go the pacifist route that you've seen many others in Europe go, and it would undermine Britain's stature as well. Yeah. Um, no, I think, well, I think your point about tearing down valued institutions is a well-made one, and they're part of what creates a country's, um, you know, domestic policy impacts on foreign policy, uh, obviously, and domestic reputation impacts on international reputation. Um, let me kind of go, we, we're, we're running out of time before we get to questions, which I'm very keen we do. Um, let me just, I want to cover a couple of other topics, which I think, you know, bring it more to the sort of present day or work. I mean, you obviously cover Vietnam, interestingly, a war where Britain decides not to participate with the United States, even though countries like Australia do. Um, and, you know, you and I were both active and I, I was an opposition politician that voted for the Iraq war. Uh, you worked in the George Bush administration. It still casts a huge shadow over uh, questions of intervention. And I remember when we were discussing in government intervening in Syria, of course, Iraq kept coming up. I mean, looking back on it, you, you don't take your book right to the present day because I don't think you wanted it to be a contemporary memoir. But um, the lessons on Vietnam, Iraq, where does Iraq... Before let's not do Vietnam, but let's do Iraq. What you know? What are your reflections on Iraq, given the lessons in your book of uh, of of where very bright people or well-intentioned people uh, can get things wrong? Well, I I think from a U.S. British point of view, I'd say that, um, and frankly, this is a broader issue about sort of U.S. alliance relations, uh, including uh, with Europe and Asia is that while now and then for US officials, it's frustrating to deal with the divergent perspectives and alliances, it probably makes for better policy over the long run. Now, I was also part of the 89-90 movement where the United States had to step forward to help with German unification where Britain and France and others were cautious. So I don't wanna suggest it's always the uh, situation, but I think um, the United States is most effective when it works with alliance partners and it's probably will act most wisely when it takes account of some of the perspectives of those partners. So I'm, I'm reading right now, George, a book called To Start a War, which is a, an account of this, uh, the Iraq issues. And I'm only halfway through it. So I, I can get some of the discussions with the effect of Blair and others. Um, but I think, you know, from a historical point of view, when, when historians really go back and look at the period, one of the things that this book draws out, which I, I think will have a lasting sort of impression, was that people may not fully appreciate today that after the shock of 9-11, the flood of messages that were coming into the White House every day, it was sort of a, a threat matrix that was unrestrained. And the fear that frankly, senior people had that they were gonna face another serious attack. And that led to the question of whether, um, uh, uh, Iraq had nuclear weapons uh, and weapons of mass destruction, uh, given its sort of record of past behavior and the dangers that were imposed on that. My own view is that absent uh, a belief that it had those weapons, I don't believe the United States would have ultimately gone to war, although there were some in the administration that probably would have wanted to, but I don't think President Bush would have. That then takes you to this critical question of intelligence. And, and I think the one reason why this, this book I mentioned is significant is you can see how the intelligence process gets twisted. And I, there's a warning here for, for officials and presidents and others, which is you probably want people in an intelligence position who are willing to be unpopular by saying things that, uh, that people don't want to hear. And uh, without getting too personal about it, <laughs> uh, 
Hank Paulson, a friend of mine and a colleague of yours, later told me that President Bush 43 said, look, you know, Paulson and I and one other person were the only people that would tell him things he really didn't want to hear. <laughs> but, and, and as you know, that's sometimes a tough part of the job. And ultimately, you're not the one that makes a decision, but it's important to go forward. So I think uh, for allies, obviously, um, you make a choice if you separate too much from the United States. So in the case of Australia, for example, I think it's building its security policy on the idea that it'll be a complement to the United States. Um, and it'll join uh, not just in terms of perimeter defense, but in terms of um, sort of the interoperability of its capacities. But as part of that, it gets a voice at the table and it should get a voice at the table. And I would apply that with Britain as well. Just on this, uh, we're gonna turn um, to questions very soon, but I just want to, there's two final topics I wanna cover. The first is China, uh, because obviously you, in the book deal with uh, Nixon and Kissinger's visit to China. Um, I think you suggest that Kissinger may have over some of Mao's uh, kind of philosophical <laughs> statements <laughs> in one of the meetings. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's fair to say, but correct me if I'm wrong, that both you and I had a quite similar view about trying to get China to engage in multilateral institutions and at least think through the consequences of of a kind of confrontation strategy. Obviously times have changed. There are things that China has done, has done that, that has made that much more difficult. Um, but where do you know, where reading, you know, you're, if you've got 200 years of diplomacy at your fingertips here in this book, perhaps the single biggest diplomatic challenge the United States and, and the Western world faces, maybe the whole world now faces, is how to accommodate China in this world. Uh, do you confront it? Do you contain it? What is what is all of that history of dealing with adversity and adversaries, different political systems, rising powers? What does it teach you? And you know, what should we draw from the book on that? Well, the starting point is uh, the limits of uh, general frameworks like competition, cooperate, contain. Um, the reality is the policy has to be made uh, across a series of issues you have to dig into. But let me, be, let me give you more my sense of a historical reference point. Um, if you really look upon the US relationship with China, which really I, I know it starts in 1784 when, when we'd send a ship and with Jingcheng from Appalachia and it's a big financial hit, there's sort of three themes. Uh, one, China as the great commercial opportunity, always a bright sun just shimmering over the horizon. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it was our fastest growing export market for 15 years prior to President Trump. Number two is the role of China as a potential power. So in my story in 1900, it's trying to avoid China's dismemberment. Uh, and uh, one of the people I mentioned, Ellie Root, says, look, this would be nothing worse than the breakup of Rome. Uh, but during most of that period, it's China as the weak power. But then starting with Nixon and others, how does China play a role in the international system? And FDR wanted it to play a role after World War II and others. And then the third, however, and Britain shares some of this, is there's a missionary tradition with China. There's the idea of trying to convert China to Christianity, uh, to capitalism, to small r republicanism. And when the Chinese reject our missionary impulses, we sometimes react as a pendulum. It's like it's, a, it's, the, it's the outrage of being turned away when you're trying to convert somebody to your cause. And so the starting point for that is I think you have to take China as it is, not as you want it to be. Now, what that would mean on the questions that you posed is, uh, number one, realize I do think there's been a change in China under Xi Jinping. I think Xi Jinping uh, sees wh where our discussion about the end of the Cold War and the Soviet Union is a historical one. For him, it's a frightening shadow over the dangers of the Chinese Communist Party. And so he's tried to reassert control. Um, and it's important to understand that reality of China. On the other hand, um, I think another important lesson would be we've been most effective, as you and I just discussed, when you work with allies. And I don't think ultimately either our European allies or our Asian allies believe you can contain China. Um, and frankly, I don't believe China is, well, it uses communism within China. I think it's really an authoritarian power. It doesn't really love the Vietnamese because they're communists or other, it works with whoever will treat it with a lot of power and respect. 
And so there, I think you need to have a deterrence strategy. Uh, you need to work with your allies. You probably have a different naval posture in the South China Sea and others. It's more anti-access area denial, just as they have. You need a different technology. So those are the practical steps. But then the, I think one other piece of new conventional wisdom in the United States, which I very much disagree with and I've written about, is this idea that cooperation with China failed. And that's just totally wrong, whether you look at proliferation policy of weapons of mass destruction or missiles. As you know, in the economic case, China had a 10% current account surplus down to zero, quit uh, manipulating its exchange rates, had one of the best stimulus programs uh, in the financial crisis, frankly, was a partner of mine at the World Bank. Uh, and if you go on to environmental or other topics, my point is not that all is well with China, but I think it's a mistake to say that you can't find areas of common ground. And if, for example, one is interested in topics like pandemics and biological security or climate change and energy in the environment uh, or economic uh, recovery of the world, you're not gonna be able to do it without China. So the question is, together with your partners and with forces within China that still recognize the importance of this, can you find some common ground? And I believe you can. It doesn't mean that, that, uh, that China is, uh, is always gonna be there as a partner. There'll be differences you have to manage. And that the last point is I, my sort of, if you wanna call it practical realism here, does not mean the United States or the West should give up on its values. So I think Britain has actually gotten Hong Kong quite right. Rather than sanction a bunch of people as we're doing, I think we should join Britain and Australia and others and say, if people want to Hong Kong want to come to Britain or the United States or Australia or others, let's bring them in. It's be, be good for us. And it's a way of really demonstrating the fundamental differences between the two societies. And, and because this is a long run competition, you know, it also deals with things like students at universities. Of course, we don't want espionage. And there's ways I believe we can uh, tighten that up. But it would be very frightening if we basically close off our universities to Asians or Chinese and others. I think that's a wonderful advertisement for America. And a lot of those young students stay in the United States, become great contributors. I don't know if you're encountering this in Britain, but the United States, we're actually starting to see some rising uh, hostility towards Chinese Americans. These are Chinese citizens that are American citizens of Chinese descent. So for the long run, part of this whole story is what you do at home is most important. <laughs> and so how we succeed in, in uh, a Britain after Brexit or the United States is going to be the real secret of success. Then it's a question of how you work with your partners. And that's a question of can you find common ground while keeping sensible deterrence? That's not the approach the Trump administration has taken. All right, so final question for me, and then, then, from, then I'll turn back to Sunil, who will uh, field some questions from the uh, audience. But, uh, so let's assume, of course, that Donald Trump and Joe Biden are busily reading your book, or if they've not already read it, <laughs> um, which at least is possible with one of them. And uh, it, let's also think um, uh, that the people who advise those people um, uh, will be reading a book, which I'm absolutely sure is true. Um, I, th I think we know that, I'm not going to ask you about Trump and you're a Republican, I think you, you've made your views quite clear if you read the book. Give us some sense of uh, what a Biden foreign policy might be like. I'm not prejudging the outcome, who knows going to win, but uh, where does Biden sit in this tradition of American foreign policy? Uh, what might we expect? And then we'll, then we'll have a few minutes for questions from others. I think the honest answer is it's quite fluid. There's a lot of people around Biden who know what they don't like. They have a very long list of things that they would like to do. But I just wrote a piece this week in Foreign Affairs Online that offered my suggestion, uh, which is that, uh, and again, this is a nice fit because in your career, George, you sort of combined the domestic with the international. You have to start out realizing if Biden's elected, he's gonna face a huge domestic agenda. He's got, a pandemic recovery and a freight healthcare system. He's got immigration issues. He's got uh, inclusive economic growth. He's got climate change uh, and energy and environmental topics. He's got racism, it's huge. And in our system, unlike the parliamentary system, um, you have to figure out what you're gonna get done with the Congress. Now, Biden has the possibility of bringing more legislative expertise than any president since LBJ, but that means he's gonna have to spend a lot of time on that agenda. 
And he's going to have to set priorities. So if he wins, it'll be interesting to watch how he structures the White House. My former boss, James Baker, I quote in the book under Reagan, said to Reagan in 1981, you have three priorities, Mr. President, economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery. So the question is, what will they be able to handle? Now, if I connect this internationally, my suggestion would be that the Biden administration, rather than chase after 100 different items, try to leverage its domestic agenda internationally. So if we come up with vaccines on the pandemic, we should not only rejoin the WHO, but we should come up with an initiative like Bush 43 did with HIV AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis in Africa. Um, if you uh, want to act more on carbon, you not only rejoin the Paris Agreement, but you try to figure out how you build more support in developing countries, such as, for example, a soil carbon initiative in sub-Saharan Africa, that could probably deal about 13 to 14 percent of the carbon needs, but be very important for agriculture or avoid a deforestation. If we do something on immigration with the Dreamers, combine it with my North America strategy with trying to support uh, improve relations with Mexico. Um, one that I come up with there, of course, is I think it'll be hard for Biden on trade, but uh, if, if he could do something, I would hope that the unions here wouldn't object too much to British work standards, um, but I would negotiate it with the three North American economies as opposed to just the United States. So my logic is that not only creates an agenda that leverages off the domestic, but it's actually a pretty good way of probably rebuilding your alliance partnerships with Europe, Britain, and with the Asia Pacific. And based on that, just as in the Cold War, if you work from your alliance, you then face the two bigger questions, the future of free societies and how do we deal with China? So I try to synthesize, that's, that's the suggestion that I come up with. So you can monitor, see what happens. <laughs> right, listen, that's the end of uh, this part of the conversation. Uh, Bob, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you, um, throwing new insights into the conversation. The book is definitely worth reading. I would uh, strongly recommend it. Uh, but I am going to hand back to Sunil, and who is going to field a couple of questions from the members of the audience. Sunil. So thank you, George. Thank you for that, George. Um, We've had a number of questions come in via email and through our Zoom chat. Um, I'm going to read one on the importance of North America. Uh, somebody's written and sent a passage in the book that they found particularly interesting was the five traditions, uh, in particular the importance of North America. Most foreign policies tend to be centered on Europe, Middle East and Asia, and you rarely see much on North America. I wanted to hear more about your thoughts on the importance of North America, as it's clear how important it was during the 19th century. Do you still feel it's equally as important today? Yes, well, that's a wonderful uh, comment. And you're, the question is exactly right. You can comb through documents that our Council on Foreign Relations and others, I mean, the only time North America gets mentioned is when I'm brought in to do a piece on it or something. Uh, and, <clears throat> and yet, as you point out, not only was it important in the 19th and 20th century, and don't forget, by the way, the Cuban Missile Crisis and other events in, in our space, but I think um, Ronald Reagan made a point. Uh, I found this speech that he gave in 1979 as he's launching his presidential campaign. So just compare this with today. And in his, in his speech launching his campaign, he says, you know, we'd be better off with our nearest neighbors, Canada and Mexico, being stronger, not weaker. And it's time that we stop treating them as foreign countries. Boy, does that sound different than today. Now, what was he also talking about? Well, number one, in terms of public interest, if you ask what the American people care about foreign policy, topics like immigration, environment, sort of effective economic integration, organized crime, smuggled people, trafficking, those are top on the American agenda of the public. So that's one way of connecting it. But then on the positive side, what I think Reagan was after and what I'm trying to do is to see North America as a continental base for U.S. policy globally. So this is not an isolationist North America, as in my case with negotiating with Britain. It's the idea that if we have 500 million people, three democracies, energy, self-sufficiency, and ability to export, frankly, better demographics than Europe or Japan or China or others, uh, and we treat our workforce while recognizing differences of citizenship as kind of a resource, um, you could see much greater possibility for the United States working with its partners. And just to give you a practical example from my experience, when I started working with Mexico in the 1980s, 
if there were a foreign policy issue uh, for Mexico's position and I, and I lost my briefing book, frankly, I could take the American position and put a minus sign in front of it because the old PRI system in Mexico put all the leftist intellectuals in the foreign ministry where they engaged in anti-Americanism. By the time of 2001, my closest partners as US trade representative were my Canadian and Mexican colleagues. And, and, uh, but to give you a better sense of implications of this, the United States just renegotiated NAFTA. And frankly, the main story of that is, even though Trump hated NAFTA and Lopez Obrador in Mexico didn't like it, we created enough cohesion over 25 years, they couldn't abandon it. But for example, we weakened the investment protections. And the former Mexican negotiator of NAFTA said, you know, this is such a shame because one of the reasons Mexico wanted those investment protections in was to import the rule of law into Mexico. And that's, the, again, the question, do you want to see a weaker Mexico or do you want to try to strengthen the system? So it runs, it has to run throughout your thinking. Uh, and of course, there's a series of issues like how you make your borders work more effectively, things that Britain will now be also dealing with. Now it's it's interesting, and um, it was last question from me. Um, a key person I, I really enjoyed reading in your book was William Seward. You know, I read Team of Rivals by Doris Goodwin, and it helps you understand how influential he was and how he almost held well. He did hold stronger anti-slavery views than even Abraham Lincoln, um, which leads on uh, leads on to the question on pragmatism. You know, he was known for his pragmatic approach, and it's a common theme throughout your book where. You, know, you discuss a lot about pragmatism in American leaders and how they tended to deal with the world. And it can be seen right from founding fathers to more recent presidents. Um, you use it as a, a, a positive and good thing throughout. Um, I wanted to know your sort of take on how important pragmatism is in leaders. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that out. So what, what I'm trying to emphasize, of course, other countries have, have a pragmatic approach to policy too. But I was trying to actually uh, distinguish what you often see in the more intellectualized discussions of policy, as George and I were talking about, that can sometimes slip into abstractions or intellectual conventions or even dogmas. Um, and what my experience has been that uh, most officials are trying to figure out how they can solve problems and deal practically uh, with consequences based on experience. And so they begin with the problem, they try to figure out means and ends and try to fix the, fix the situation. Now, let me be more specific. What it means is if you're a pragmatic policymaker, you start out with attention to realities on the ground, whether it's military power, economic power, as George and I discussed, technology, votes, whatever are the key sort of factors. You also have to have an awareness of processes and institutions. How do you get things done as opposed to just make statements? You need to understand the positions of others and what are their interests in the process. You need to have a strong sense of timing, which is a theme I draw out in a number of cases in the book. And as I mentioned before, you have to recognize sometimes having imperfect results in a far from perfect world is, is still a, a good score. So I don't mean to say that pragmatism should uh, overcome any sense of visions. Americans have had ideas and ideologies uh, throughout their history, but they don't hold to them rigidly. And so I'm not trying to suggest a simple formula for suggest. I'm trying to describe the world as I've seen it work. And what the stories are about to a certain degree are people who manage these more or less effectively. So in the case of LBJ, I explain actually how his focus on domestic politics, I think led him into tragedy. I point out some of Wilson's limits as an operational art of diplomacy. So I'm not trying to suggest that there's sort of one mechanism, um, but it goes back to the point that I started with, which is, uh, when I've talked to younger people that are studying foreign affairs in universities, they, they sort of, you know, it's, is it offshore balancing? Is it realism? Is it idealism? Well, to be honest, you know, if George and I are dealing with the question of China, how far does that take you? You have to figure out what are you going to do on specific problems, whether they be intellectual property rights or forced technology transfer uh, and other arrangements. So what I'm trying to explain from my experience of pragmatism is that's not only how the world works, but frankly, if you want to play a role in it, it's a good set of things, uh, lessons to learn. I agree with that. <laughs> I, I'm moving away from your book, we've had a number of questions on uh, the economy. Um, 
I, I've heard you say recently how you felt the only way the global economy will emerge from the recession is cooperation. Uh, dealing with a recession is something you have experience in and having served as president of the World Bank between 2007 and uh, 12. Um, I, I heard you also warned that the world could look a lot more like uh, 1900 when the great powers were in competition. Um, if countries start to pull away from globalization and pursue nationalist interest. I, I know we've talked a bit about China, and I'm sure we could probably talk about China for a, a good few more hours. Um, how should or how would you advise countries like the US and UK to react going forward? Well, I, I've just written an opinion piece uh, that uh, one of our major newspapers is going to told me they'd print next week, so I can't get too far ahead of this. but. Uh, what I've been most worried about is two things. One, uh, during the global financial crisis, where George played a critical role, the, the degree of cooperation, uh, and it also preceded him, frankly, with Gordon Brown and the London D20 Summit, um, it wasn't perfect, but boy, it, it was a critical response uh, in terms of dealing not only with the immediate problems of demand and monetary policy, but also some of the issues in maintaining global economy. Um, as I look at the world of the G20 today, and I look at the state of cooperation, uh, it leaves me much less comforted, <laughs> the ability to, uh, you know, China and the United States worked quite closely in 2008 and 9 and afterwards. Well, now we're at each other's throats. My, my greatest worry, and this is what the piece about, however, is, is that um, the attention to the developing countries has really dropped off. Um, and in 2008, 9, and 10, the developing countries actually created a supplementary engine of growth. They helped the recovery. Now, I'm very quite concerned, not only because of the pandemic, but the economic effects on developing economies, that, uh, that we could face a decade of stagnation. And that has implications not only for world growth, but for topics like migration, which we're concerned about in North America or people in Europe are concerned about. It has implications for stability and political systems. So the point of this piece is as we approach the annual World Bank uh, fund meetings in October done virtually and the G20 meeting being chaired by Saudi Arabia, and that gives you some sense of leadership, um, you know, kind of trying to prod people to realize you can't really have a recovery from this global pandemic unless you deal with some of these issues. And also this goes to questions of support for vaccine distribution globally. So it's a combination of the frayed international system and the points that while that system is far from perfect, um, we've seen that uh, when, when it comes apart or didn't exist as in 1900, the world could look like a much more dangerous place. And I would add, you know, this is, so one, one big question here will be, and George and I have talked about this, is where does Britain fit in that system afterwards? This is, this is something, you know, that, you know, I, I know gets talked about, about different ways about Britain, but I think this is quite significant. I mean, you know, if we think about historically Britain's role, yeah, of course it's going to evolve and change, but uh, I, I, I think the world will be a lot worse off if Britain doesn't figure out how it will continue to adapt whether it's with its universities, whether taking advantage of its strengths with some of its institutions, treasury, macro policy, the Bank of England, uh, its universities. And for goodness sakes, going back to the point that George and I talked about with confidence, keep your country together. I mean, it, it, I hope people understand if, if Great Britain breaks up, that's going to be a huge sign to the rest of the world that you've lost control. And we don't want that to happen. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the final question we've got in, um, your work has spanned six different presidents with that in mind and including all US leaders, which presidents looking back, do you think deserve more credit for their foreign policy and which ones do you think receive too much praise for their policy? <laughs> so on the first question, uh, this, this is one George and I didn't get to, but I have a chapter on Bush 41 and Baker. So this was the 1982 to 93 period. Um, fortunately, Bush 41 is getting uh, more retrospective appreciation, um, not only in his role with the end of the Cold War in Europe and the Gulf War coalition, but one of the things I point out in the book is that, and this is a wonderful irony, this one-term president in many ways 
sets the agenda for both Clinton and Bush 43 to both have two terms. Because in addition to the events in Europe and the Soviet Union, you had the Middle East peace process launched after the Gulf War, you have NAFTA, you have the Uruguay round that creates the WTO, you have the creation of APEC, which Clinton makes into uh, a summit level. Um, uh, very few people are aware that the, uh, the only climate change treaty that, that is ratified by the US Senate was a 1992 treaty, which I might add I worked on. <laughs> and, and that's the framework agreement that frankly the Paris Accord and others have, have come out of. But as, as George will point out, there's a lesson there too, which is that Bush didn't win re-election. And since I went to the White House with Baker in 92, Deputy Chief of Staff, I'll tell you that when we tried to run ads that talked about his success internationally, the response of the public was, yeah, we know what he could do overseas. Why can't he do more for us? So that's, that's one of the challenges uh, of any elected official uh, with the two. Uh, as, as for ones that um, are sort of on the fringe, JFK is always a figure of history because of the tragedy of his assassination. I, I, in that chapter, I talk about his crisis management style. And this is a mixed story because on the one hand, he does show an ability to learn. He's actually better than his advisors. And between his early crises, um, where whether it was with uh, the Bay of Pigs or frankly uh, in Vienna with, uh, with Khrushchev, he actually learns how to deal with crises with, and leading to the Berlin-Cuba crisis at the end, uh, which he manages quite successfully. But I close that chapter, and, and this is where history is better than fiction. On the, on the night before he goes to Dallas, he meets his advisor on Vietnam who's going overseas and said, you know, I'm not really sure how we're positioned in Vietnam. When you come back, I want to have a serious discussion about even whether we stay in that conflict. So this is the unresolved crisis uh, because the next day he goes to Dallas and is assassinated. So, um, uh, and I think the one other one that for this audience might be interesting is Reagan. Reagan is a very hard figure for historians to still grasp today. I mean, he's obviously successful, but his style was so different. And I use the speech actually that he delivered uh, uh, at Westminster as, as kind of, as a, as a way of explaining how Reagan throughout his life as a radio announcer and as an actor and others, used the process of writing to form his ideas and convictions and focus. And it gave him a, an ability to use oratory as a diplomatic tool quite effectively as we see over time, but it needed the complement of people who could help him with the operational or negotiation part. Sir George Schultz draws Reagan into the negotiation with Gorbachev in his second term they both like negotiations. My boss Baker played the role on domestic policy in the first term, international economic policy in the second term. And you can see in the Middle East and Iran where he didn't really have that compliment, things could go awry. So I guess one of the other concluding points is, in addition to looking at a person, it's important to look at the team. Nobody has all the qualities. And the question is, you know, do people, when George is asking me about the Iraq war and I talked about the intelligence function, you know, do, 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 do leaders understand the need to have somebody around who can be trusted but can also caution against something? Uh, are there people who can bring in other traits and talents? And you see, you talked about Lincoln and Seward uh, and, and uh, the history that Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote um, you, uh, with team of rivals. You can see how people complement each other. So uh, this perhaps is better for parliamentary systems because you're voting for a party and sort of a shadow cabinet. And our system where it focuses on the president, sometimes it'll be equally important to say, well, who's around the president and who, presidents in the United States don't have equals, but they might have peers. Who do they, who do they consider as people who they know and trust that can give them frank advice? And when you've seen where a president doesn't have that, they can get into deep trouble. Well, that concludes our webinar today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you both here. Uh, thank you, George, for your input and questions today. It's been very much appreciated and hopefully we can see you again. Um, if you haven't already, I, I thoroughly recommend reading Robert's book, um, America in the World, a History of the US Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. We've sent out a link uh, where you can purchase that. Um, Great 16 accounts of important figures, you know, each giving fascinating portrait of um, um, American history. And 
insights that you probably won't have heard before. You know, I, I found it a real pleasure to read in particular, um, as we are at a time where we do need strategic direction and guidance. Um, so a huge thank you to Robert for his insights today. Um, and I hope everyone who's tuned, tuned in has enjoyed our webinar. And hopefully we can all see you again on the 21st of September for our event with Sir Linton Crosby. But yeah, thank you again to George and Robert. Thanks, Thanks for having Bob. me. Thanks, George. Thank Thanks, Bob. Enjoy your evenings. Thank you.